Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. It's it's 12 p.m. So hello everyone and welcome to the ADR Lunchtime Series, a program presented by the Workplace Conflict Management Section of the Interagency Alternative Dispute Resolution Working Group in coordination with the Department of Energy's ADR office. My name is Adam Kerfman and I am an attorney here in the ADR office at the Department of Energy. As always, Thank you all. Thank you to all in attendance today and to those whose efforts make today possible. Sharam Gesemian, the Workplace Conflict Management Section's Chair and the Department of Energy's ADR Office's uh, Director. Isabella Faraz, my ADR Office teammate. Lee Blackard, our technical support extraordinaire. And the many individuals who support and help spread awareness for the ADR Lunchtime Series. Today's topic has generated significant interest, and it's clear that the cost of workplace conflict is at the, forefront, at the forefront of many individuals' minds. We therefore consider it quite the privilege to have Chaplain Kenneth Williams join us for today's program. Ken is an active duty U.S. Army officer who serves on the faculty of the National Defense University as an instructor in courses in leadership and ethics. He received his PhD in leadership and organizational change and his research, which focuses on the costs, prevalence, and effects of toxic, toxic behavior in the workplace, has been published in several journals and periodicals. He's passionate about leader development, leadership as influence without authority, and about eliminating toxic and abusive behaviors in the workplace, as he, believe that, as he believes that everyone deserves a workplace characterized by trust and respect. So without further ado, I turn the podium over to Ken. Thank you so much, Adam, for your introduction and for your kind invitation to be here. Uh, I'm very excited about the opportunity to chat with you about uh, some things I've been trying to learn about uh, creating cultures and conditions in the workplace so that people feel uh, empowered that they can thrive and succeed. Uh, and, and that's really what I've uh, uh, been devoting the last few years of my life uh, to do. Uh, it's a very wonderful time of season uh, where we have the holidays, everything's uh, decorated and very festive. And um, in thinking about the holidays, this time of season, I'd like to give you a gift. And the gift that I'd like to give you is a work environment that is peaceful, that enables you to thrive, that is full of respect, and uh, that you are excited to get to in the morning. That's what I'd like to give you. So uh, my wife and I, as we started talking about giving gifts to our family members, we have some children and grandchildren that have very busy lives. And so we decided that we would give them one of these uh, programmable pots, pressure cooker things, you know, um, so that they can program it, put the food in, they can come home, it's all ready to go. And the only concern that I have is that, will they actually use it? <laughs> and that's kind of like what I'm thinking about today. I, I can't give you that kind of environment. I can only help us talk about the tools that we can apply to create that environment. So that's what today's all about. We have two million or, or so federal employees in, in, in the government. And in the DOD, there's about 1.4 million active duty personnel, about 1.1 million reservists, a little over 860,000 civilians that work in the DOD. We have a tremendous workforce, highly dedicated to serve the public. And each one of us deserves a workplace that is meaningful, respectful, peaceful, encouraging, enabling us to thrive. And that's really what I'm all about today and, and I think why we're here. Um, so I'd like for us to think of our workplace as a garden. And if you're going to have a garden, you have to have a gardener. And as I think in my mind about gardening and gardeners, I come up with there's three kinds of gardeners. 
One is the unaware gardener. This is the person that wants fresh vegetables, enjoys fresh vegetables, but really doesn't put forth the effort to till the soil, cultivate the soil, prepare it, doesn't take real care with the plants uh, when the planting is done, really doesn't tend to, it really doesn't water, really doesn't pay attention, but expects there's going to be produce at the end of the season. Right? Then there is the benign gardener. This is the gardener that may cultivate the soil, may prepare things, may remove the re weeds, rocks, and debris, plants the plants, waters periodically because he or she remembers from uh, high school or junior high biology class that plants need water th to survive, but really doesn't really pay close attention. Doesn't really harm the garden, but doesn't really facilitate growth either, the benign gardener. Then there's the attentive gardener. This is a person that cultivates the soil, removes the reeds, the weeds, rocks, and debris, and tends very carefully, noticing the, the moisture in the soil, provides the right amount of fertilizer, um, pays attention to pests and disease, and, and addresses those. And this type of gardener really does pr produce great uh, fruit from his or her garden. So. Think about what kind of gardener you are, what kind of gardeners we have in our organizations. This has been a journey for me. Uh, I, I got very interested in uh, toxic personalities, hostile work environments. Um, really throughout my career as a, an army officer and as a chaplain, because I wanted to create, help create conditions. Uh, but it really came to a head when I went to work at the Pentagon. Uh, so don't get, laugh about that. But, um, I, I went there to serve as a chaplain, uh, not as a staff person, but as, as a chaplain providing religious support. And over the course of my time there, I kept noticing lots of workplace issues. And uh, um, uh, as I continued to serve there, uh, the fellow chaplains and I in my office, we began to chat about things and, and one day we just had this conversation about what, you know, what kind of counseling, what kind of people are you talking to? And, and it just seemed like there was this high prevalence of hostile work environment issues. So we began to start exploring that and researching that and addressing that and having programs to do that. And so I've been on this journey since then uh, and that's been uh, eight years ago. And I've just been trying to explore and, and uh, expand my knowledge and so this is a product of, of this journey that I've been on. Um, I uh, began to write some articles. I kept thinking well you're gonna get some uh, pushback. You're gonna get some uh, people that are not happy about what you're writing and, and uh, so a couple of pu uh, articles published and you know it was like crickets. You know, mm -hmm. Nobody was okay. Everybody kept telling me this is an issue. I kept getting some anecdotal um, feedback, but no real prevalence. It's like, well, how can I really address this? How can I get attention? And so somebody said, well, you know, the government runs on money, so uh, you know, everybody's interested in money. Why don't you find out how much it costs? And I'm like, okay. So I began to do some research, finding out that there's not a whole lot of information out there, but a few things that I put together. So we're going to talk a little bit about cost today. Um, and, and then launch, uh, go off on some other uh, uh, actions to how do we address this. Um, but the first thing uh, I want us to look at is what is leadership all about? Uh, some of you probably know that you know, the Treasury agents um, used to be, it may have changed, but used to be they, uh, in order to identify the counterfeit bills, they would study, not the counterfeit bills, they would study the real thing. So they could spot the counterfeit very quickly. So what I'd like for us to do is look at what leadership is about. This is my favorite definition of leadership. There's lots of other ones, but this one says, leadership is an influence relationship among leaders and followers who intend real changes that reflect their mutual purposes. To me, that is so significant because it says leadership is a relationship. The focus is on relationship. 
the interaction between the leader and the follower. Um, co contrast that with uh, my organization's definition, the Army's, says leadership is applying purpose, motivation, and direction for mission accomplishment. And so the emphasis there is on doing something, getting something done. To me, leadership is not about coercion. It's not about threats. It's not about manipulation. It's about developing a relationship of trust. Stephen Covey in his book, The Speed of Trust, says, over time I've come to this simple definition of leadership. It is inspiring uh, or getting results in a way that inspires trust. And so think about how we do think about tr uh, leadership. Is it about trust or not? Is it just about getting results or is it about how we go about getting results? And uh, toxicity, toxic personalities, abusive supervisors, bullies in the workplace, that's all about sabotaging trust. So I have a friend at work and we had this ongoing dialogue about toxic leadership and he's about got me convinced that there's no such thing as toxic leadership because he says if it's toxic it's not leadership there may be abusive bosses there may be toxic supervisors toxic personalities bullies but and they may get some results, there's always a tax involved with it, but those are not leaders. So real leadership is about facilitating trust, my friend says. So leaders are the ones who set the conditions in the organization for people to thrive and grow and flourish. And leadership is a social construct. It's how we work together as leaders and followers, peers and subordinates to create this relationship called trust uh, and high performance and for people to thrive and grow. So contrast that with toxicity. When an organism ingests a toxin, what happens? Well, they can't reproduce. Their growth is stifled. Development is stunted. They can't process nutrition. Their systems shut down. When they get injured, they can't heal. And that's what a toxic environment's like. And I'm sure, we, uh, well, our research, we asked our students a lot of questions about the toxic leaders that they have, see, I, I just did it myself, the toxic people that they work for, the bosses. And uh, in uh, an average of a little over 18 years of service, our students had, they said that they had three toxic bosses in those 18 years. Now think about that. About a third of your career is spent dealing with someone who is abusive, demeaning, belittling. Okay? And what that does to the organization. So these are empirically uh, researched items that have been associated with toxic, uncivil, hostile work environments. And just look at the individual effects, the effects on the team, effects on the organization, and how impactful it is to performance. So we asked our students, to think about the most uh, toxic boss that they had worked for and how they were affected. And some of the bullying uh, hostile workplace literature talks about uh, in order for something to be classified as toxic bullying, it needs to occur at least once, maybe twice a week for a period of uh, six months. So someone's getting regularly targeted with, with uh, negative behavior. And these are the things that they say, say that they were affected most by. Um, if 
leadership is a relationship of trust, 58% said they avoided the toxic leader. 51% said they worried about the next engagement with the leader. 51% said that they discussed it with a family member. One of my good friends, uh, Dr. Jude Black, did her PhD research on the effects on the family members of a toxic boss and the treatment of the spouse and that spouse coming home and sharing that, the effects. 43, almost 44% says they, they talked about it with a coworker. So think about the time that's wasted. In fact, all of all the waste that occurs from a toxic leader, our students said that when they were working under that toxic boss, about 15 hours a week, they, they were wasting from you know, all of these activities. So I wrote this article thinking, oh, you're gonna get a lot of pushback and everybody says, oh, you're, you better get prepared. Nothing happened, so I, I'll, then I went into, okay, well, how much does it actually cost, okay? So all of these behaviors, what kind of waste is going on? So I, I came up with a formula. I did a lot of research, civility and so on. There's some great people that do wonderful research. Uh, Christine Porath, uh, Christine Pearson, um, you might find those. But uh, I, I took some of their models, a couple other different models, and tried to figure this out. And so I, I came up with this example. A thousand member organization, um, some of the prevalence, uh, depending on the research, somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of workers in the, in the workforce experience toxic. So I'm just going to go with the, the low end, let's 10 percent. So 100 members of a thousand member organization are experiencing it. And I'm just going with an, this is low, okay, an annual salary of about $50,000. I realize that's a little low, but let's just go with that. Work hours during a year. Uh, 2080, so uh, divide that 50,000 by 2,000, you get hourly wage of about $24, okay, so multiplying how much time people are wasting uh, giving to or dealing with a, a toxic boss, here's what I come up with, okay, so about 50 people uh, are giving 3.6 or so hours a week worrying about this. They're spending that much time, okay? Multiply that times the, their wage of $24, and there's the cost. Spending time avoiding the person, intentionally avoiding the toxic boss. Spending time at the coffee pot or the water cooler or at the uh, smoking station, all right? Absenteeism. Now, these are uh, military... Uh, primarily military, but we have some uh, senior government people at our, our school. So um, they're not inclined, they have to be at work. Now what we didn't ask them was the amount of time they spent in presenteeism. You familiar with presenteeism? You know, they're there at work physically, but their mind is somewhere else, right? Okay, and you know, people in the military are not inclined to talk about you know, that they can't be physically fit uh, or mentally fit. So that may be a little bit low, but you know, talk about going to see a doctor, going to see a mental health provider. I think those might be a little bit low figures, uh, perhaps. But what about replacement figures? You know, people leave. Why? I mean, all the research shows people don't leave because they uh, don't like the mission of the organization. They leave because they can't stand working for a toxic boss. But look at the replacement costs. So a hypothetical, a thousand member organization, $4 million. You know, the uh, budget, the personnel budget, if we go by those numbers, and I realize these are hypothetical and um, I, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a budget person, <laughs> I'm not a personnel guy, but if we say this thousand member organization has uh, a personnel budget of $50 million, that's just a little under 10%. Well, that's just 10%. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have a line item in your budget for abusive bosses? <laughs> yeah, you, you do now. 
I mean, seriously, what is it costing us to tolerate this, to put up with this, to enable this, and not addressing it? I mean, what could you do with 10% more? And again, I, these figures I think are low. What about 15%? What about 20% more in your budget? What could you do with that? Now, I recognize there's some actual costs and there's some opportunity costs and, and things are kind of nebulous, okay? I recognize that. But just think about what we could be doing if we took the time to really hold people accountable in a respectful manner and address the issue. So here's what I'd like for us to do next. Let's talk about the perpetrators. What are the, what are the people like? What are the, the abusive uh, supervisors like? Who are the workplace bullies? And you've probably experienced uh, uh, some of this, and you've probably read some about these folks. But I think there are several different kinds. I think some are, are uh, inherently toxic. These are the narcissists. They grew up uh, in life learning certain tactics to get their way, to get what they want, to get what they need. And so some of those tactics are, are quite abusive and manipulative and coercive. Then I think there are some functionally uh, toxic people. They're, they may not be inherently toxic, but they think in order to get things done, I have to be a real jerk at work. You know? uh, I have to be very hateful, uh, mean, and manipulative. Then I think there are some that are situationally toxic. They, they may not be inherently toxic, but they have a particular leadership style and pattern of behavior, and they're thrown into a situation in which those two really don't mix very well. Um, I'm, I'm acquainted with uh, an individual who, by all accounts, was very successful as a military officer and uh, was very much um, a, a combat arms, uh, go to war, uh, deal with conflict kind of person. And, uh, you know, highly deployed, uh, very successful, um, promoted early to the next ranks, and found himself in an organization that was primarily civilian and was told in preparation going there, this is the worst division in the whole organization. We need you to fix it. And so he was set up for, I think, failure because he was a very hard-charging kind of guy, needed to make some changes, and certainly there were some changes that needed to be made to improve performance. But because of his style, he went about it in a way that was very much command and control. And so I would say he was situationally toxic, and we have some, some things like that. People who um, are toxic tend to congregate in certain um, organizations, organizations that are high stress, low uh, autonomy, that don't have much decision-making authority. They're, they're somewhere in the chain of command. Uh, there are organizations in which there are lots of change going on, maybe downsizing. Downsizing has been associated with you know, toxic behaviors. Um, they individually may be highly employable um, and have high, high, you know, great skills. And so what these mean to me is that they are in a position where they don't have much authority, but they're good at something. And so they use that good something to create an environment that suits them. We might describe toxic people as sharks. Sharks generally don't attack directly. They attack aggressively when the victim, the target, is not paying attention. They're opportunistic. They stop at nothing once the feeding starts. There's a an old article was written back in the early 1800s 
by a gentleman uh, in France named Voltaire Cousteau. Don't know much about him, but uh, he wrote an article uh, directed toward sponge divers. And it was about how to thrive when swimming with the sharks. And the first rule that Mr. Cousteau, I don't know if he's related to Jacques, uh, said was, you should assume that if you can't identify a fish, it's probably, you know, assume that it's a shark. Now, not all fish are sharks, but some fish act like sharks. And so I'd like to apply that here. And looking at the organizations that uh, tend to draw those toxic people and thinking about toxic people as being sharks, it's like, I'm in survival mode as the shark, and I'm going to do what I do best, and that's eat. Yeah. So these are six behaviors. They come from uh, Cousy and Holloway and George Reed's book, uh, Tarnished, Toxic Leadership in the U.S. Military. But perhaps you've experienced uh, some of these behaviors, um, shaming. I once observed a presentation on management internal controls program, and the presenter would get about five minutes into the presentation, and her supervisor interrupted her and would say, now, what she really meant to say here was, and then the person would resume presenting and would be interrupted by her supervisor again and say, well, now what she forgot to say, but she really didn't know is, and this went on for an hour, about every five or 10 minutes, humiliation. So you've been experienced, I'm sure you've experienced people or seen people getting thrown under the bus, leaders playing stump the chump in staff meetings, asking questions and then not getting an appropriate answer and can't believe you would you didn't know that how long have you worked here yeah. and then passive hostility the backhanded compliments have you heard things like this oh you're so young to have been given such responsibility or something like this oh the policy that John wrote and sent up to the boss came back with no red marks no corrections whatsoever Nobody has ever done something like that in this organization before. So what was maybe could have been a, a compliment to John was really a backhanded slap against the rest of the team members. Passive hostility. And who hasn't received the, uh, the snide, uh, blatantly hostile email, right? Then team sabotage. Toxic leaders, uh, they're all about themselves, even to the detriment of the team. Pitting people against each other, spreading rumors, creating unhealthy competition among uh, members or teams, dysfunctional communication, constantly changing things. There's no stability, no consistency. And tolerating unproductive meetings. Why are the meetings unproductive? What's up with that? Well. In a meeting, the toxic person has to be the center of attention. If the, if the meeting resolves something, then the attention's on the resolution of the problem. And the toxic person has to keep creating drama. Then there's a lack of compassion. No concern and care for others. Never listening to anybody else. The corrosive, negative interpersonal style, the harshness, the incivility. And then exploiting the system, exploiting the others to get ahead, using other people's work as his or her own, or spinning the data to make himself or herself look good. And I mentioned earlier, at least twice a week for a duration of six months is, is a standard uh, response from, uh, from research. So we asked our students, what behaviors did you observe on a... Uh, and what was the frequency? And those that said they observed this, these behaviors on at least a weekly basis, well, just take a look at those. Lack of self-awareness, especially of toxic behavior. 
passive hostility, distrust of others' opinion or expertise, defensive and territorial. Taken together, what do these all mean? To me, they mean the use and abuse of power to maintain control and to oppress and constrain others and the organization. How do you detect these people? Well, talk to people who are experts at managing up. They're good at kissing up and kicking down. You know, they know how to make themselves look good to the boss. If you want to detect them, do some investigation. Be a researcher. Collect data from all kinds of uh, people, uh, peers, subordinates, all levels. Notice how the climate changes when that person is present when that, rather than uh, contrast with when they're absent. I was leading a, a culture, uh, a, a team building uh, activity one time and, and uh, I had suspicions about this particular leader, but the leader couldn't be there at the beginning of the event and we were doing all kinds of exercises and people were engaged and laughing and having a good time and then the supervisor came in and it was like a depressive cloud came upon the organization. Everything just kind of shut down. I'm like, oh, okay, confirmation. Then she had to leave early and everybody perked back up again. Hmm, so it really is a sign. Robert Sutton in his book, The, the No Asshole Rule. Uh, Robert, Robert Sutton, a uh, professor at Stanford. Uh, I highly recommend this book. Um, he says two tests are essential. After you chat with that person, how do you feel? Do you feel humiliated? Do you feel oppressed? Do you feel taken advantage of? And also, notice who that person addresses their toxicity toward? Is it someone generally of less power and authority than them? What do we do with these people? Sometimes they can't work in one section, so we pass them around. Let's restructure. Let's reorganize. Oh, let's find a new position. So then we pass their viral toxicity all around the organization instead of actually addressing it. So that, those are the uh, a description of the toxic people. You've probably experienced those things, probably read about those things. I just wanted to review it right quick. But let's ask this question. Why do these people exist and thrive? So Kuzi and Holloway in their book, Toxic Workplace, Managing Toxic Personalities and Their Systems of Power, they say these people exist because the organization's culture enables them, and empowers them. What an indictment on us. You mean I contribute to the culture and I contribute to this? Yeah. Yeah, we do. So let's look at how that happens. Yeah. The organization culture creates the conditions. So here's what Shine says about culture. Culture is a pattern of basic assumptions Invented, discovered, or developed by a given group as it learns to cope with its problems of external adaptation and internal integration. That has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore is to be taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to those problems. Okay, big long definition. What's he saying? We learn how to survive. We learn how to get along. And when we have toxic personalities in our organization, we learn how to survive in spite of them. And sometimes our behaviors are not very healthy, but they enable us to survive. We learn these behaviors. And we might say, well, we have our culture. We have our core values. We have our mission and vision. Center. They're mounted on the wall. Well, yeah, but... We have their, our spouse culture, and then we have our actual culture. We have what we say we're about, but then there is, here's how we really get along. 
In other words, you know, culture is, oops, culture is the way we get things done around here. Thinking about how culture forms, there are several culture forming mechanisms according to Shine. The first is the leader's example. In toxic environments, leaders tend not to recognize their direct reports who have toxic personalities and behaviors. Cousy and Holloway's research in their book says, in terms of power differentials, our research showed that leaders who have people with toxic personalities reporting to them are less likely to see a systemic problem than if the toxic person is their peer or boss. Additionally, in toxic organizations, there is generally a toxic protector and a toxic buffer. There may be a deputy working for a toxic boss, and the deputy knows that this person is a bear to work for. And so that person buffers the toxicity that is expressed and is in some ways trying to protect the rest of the people. Now, that is good in a way because it stops the stuff from rolling downhill, but it's also not good in a way because it continues to enable the person to spew their toxicity. Then there is a toxic protector, someone who has um, a stake in the benefits that the toxic behavior provides. The toxic person may get some results or may give the appearance of results and the toxic protector is the beneficiary. Look how wonderful the organization is running. Look how much they are improving. Look at the productivity and the performance. And so they're willing to protect that toxic person and put up with that toxic behavior for the perceived or actual benefits that that provides. Defining and measuring success. In toxic organizations, the metrics focus on producing results without a concern over how the results are obtained. Also, the metrics do not clearly spell out the values and what they mean and how to apply them. What is it? What does meaningful communication and respectful communication mean to us? How should we email each other? There's no specificity about values. Metrics reinforce behavior. And the extreme emphasis on results and the punishment that comes from failing to uh, meet mission or meet the performance standards results in people learning how to put spin on the metrics, how to adjust things, how to make themselves look good to avoid the punishment of the toxic personality. The crisis response. When the organization goes through a, a crisis or a change, or let's say someone voices, uh, files a grievance uh, about their, uh, how they've been treated, how does the organization respond? Do they adhere to their values, their espoused values, or do they abandon them in the, the times of hardship? I remember uh, uh, addressing or helping people deal with an issue in an organization in the Pentagon. There was an individual who um, began their work in the Pentagon by working for a vendor. Um, uh, if you've been in, the, you know, there, there are several stores in the, in the Pentagon, uh, and she worked in one of those stores that provided uh, some goods for, for folks. And someone liked her, and uh, 30 years ago gave her, you know, offered her a job in one of the organizations. She became like a, uh, a lower level GS employee. But then over the course of 25 or so years, uh, got promoted, 
but got promoted by being this toxic person, eventually becoming a senior supervisor and being very manipulative, micromanaging, belittling, um, uh, just a, a very degrading kind of person. It took a couple of IG complaints and an EO investigation for them to finally say, we think you need to, it's time for you to retire. But think of all the people that she had come in contact with and, and the, the viral toxicity that, hit, that she had spread. The organization, over the years, failed to see the crisis that was on their hands and address the, the behavior. Recognizing performance. People want to do well, and they want their performance reinforced, and they want to be praised. In toxic organizations, Leaders in the organization are tolerant as long as the person is productive. There's a lack of accountability because they see that there's, there's some benefit that this person brings to the organization. If they're highly skilled, we need this person. And that's part of the way the toxic person works. They create this codependent relationship. You can't do it without me. And so people are afraid to hold them accountable or what might happen in response. If the leader in the organization praises and promotes toxic personalities, people learn that toxic behaviors that lead to success, and learn that toxic behaviors lead to success and that appearances are more important than actual results. Then the distribution of resources. In toxic environments, the favored pet projects of the boss get the resources and that there's tolerance of unproductive meetings. If there's favoritism, people tend to spend their energy trying to get that favor, trying to get those resources. They learn that there's an in-group and there's an out-group. They learn the purpose of meetings is not coordination and collaboration, but to stoke the boss's ego. So they try to play up to that boss. And then the development of followers. In toxic environments, the climate changes when the per toxic person is present. The leader's favorite gets the attention. Those who play the game are rewarded. The development of leaders involves reinforcing the status quo and consolidating the boss's power. It's not about reinforcing the espoused culture. In other words, taken all together, the culture tolerates and, uh, and undermines the core values of respect, courage, commitment, excellence, selfless service, integrity, honor, and trust. These culture forming mechanisms highlight two key factors of neutralizing behaviors. And that's this, the dynamics of the interactions between individuals and teams and organizations, processes, uh, systems, that nature determines how effective the organization is going to be at addressing toxicity. And the second is that the values of the organization are the key to addressing toxic behaviors. So how do you neutralize these toxic behaviors? How do you do this? So a few years back, General Odin Arano, Chief of Staff of the Army, testifying on the Hill, ask the question. Here's what he says. We're just going to fire them all as soon as we fi find them. Okay, you can't just go around firing people. Okay. Well, why can't we go around firing people? Well, because even if you fire them, you still have this culture. You still have the conditions in your garden. What are the conditions in the garden? Second of all, firing them demonstrates that you really don't understand the process. It's not just the individual, whether they're inherently toxic, whether they're functionally toxic, whether they're situationally toxic, it's the conditions of the organization. And third, people who have left, even if you fire them, what about the people that are left? They've learned these behaviors, this pattern of behavior that needs to be addressed. So you got to do more than just firing the toxic people or fire, you know, collecting the data, put them on a performance improvement, improvement plan. So Kuzi and Holloway says, 
they, they say toxic, toxicity flourishes in situations in which the organization does not provide concrete behaviorally specific values and has a high tolerance for toxic behaviors. You know, they put up with it. Many organizations have stated values, but the, stating these values is not enough. If we're going to address it, we have to engage strategies at three different levels, organizational-wide, the team level, and individuals. So that's what I want us to look at next. What are some strategies? First thing we got to do is work on, the, work on the condition of our garden. Be very specific. What's appropriate? What's not appropriate? Clarify. What does it mean to be, have respectful communication? How do we praise people? How do we correct people? How do we distribute re resources? Go back to all of those uh, culture-forming mechanisms. Second, incorporate respect and trust in the leader development to reinforce that leadership involves both results and values. Well, you don't know that we don't have a leadership development budget anymore. You know, that's the first thing that gets cut, right? Well, every staff meeting that you have is an opportunity for leader development because the people are modeling the culture. How is the culture modeled in there? Is it just, are, are the spouse values just things that we post on the wall? Or do we engage in respect and trust in, in our staff meetings? Incorporate values into performance feedback to, uh, to clarify expectations and select team members for the desired culture. Now, um, my wife was a, a, a recently retired as a senior government uh, employee, supervisor. I've talked to uh, lots of HR people, and I've asked them questions about this, and they say, if you are very explicit in your uh, duty description, if you're very explicit in... Uh, the job description that in, and the posting that we have to have this kind of person who demonstrates respect because this is our mission or demonstrates this value or that value. If you can put that in there and tie it to performance in some way, then you've got a leg up because you've clarified here's what the expectations are. So again, I'm not a personnel guy. Uh, I'm an army officer or chaplain, but I've asked people, can you do this? How can you, how can you incorporate values? And that, that's what they said. So here's what I would say. Talk to your HR people. But the first thing that, that uh, Shine says, the first thing that Kuzi and Holloway say is, we have to clarify expectations based upon values. So throw those, thing, those items out. Use 360-degree feedback systems to create self-awareness and improve performance. So those 360-degree uh, tools are very helpful. I don't think we use them very well. And uh, you know, we don't use them to provide the kind of feedback that's going to shape behavior. Conduct targeted feedback to address and coach behavior change. If you're a supervisor and you discover someone, one of your subordinates is uh, wreaking havoc, have a good chat with them and not just say, well, your behavior is inappropriate. It needs to change. Most toxic people don't think they have a problem. <laughs> and they're going, to, they're going to deny it. So if you want to cause some change, you're going to have to address it specifically and reinforce it on a regular basis. So what's toxic feedback? So in Kuzi and Holloway's book, they talk about sitting down with a person, being very specific about how their behavior is affecting the organization, how it's a violation of, it's violating the core values, and then work with them to brainstorm what are some ideas to help you change? What are some tactics? What are some things you're gonna uh, brainstorm courses of action? Pick one of the courses of action to for them to work on. Have them go away, work on it. Come back on a periodic basis, weekly or every other week, to check on their performance. How's it going? You know, in what, when are you sabotaging yourself? When are you setting off uh, on others, going off on others? What's, what's going on with that? And so it's a very time-intensive and energy-intensive process if you want to help them change. And I know that 
Uh, we have a lot of, of uh, senior people who are supervisors here, and, and you've done this, but it takes a lot of work for dealing with a toxic personality. Identify the toxic protectors and the toxic bu buffers and have a chat with them. Do you realize that your behavior really isn't helping the situation? You're enabling, you're condoning. We need to do something different about this person. A recognized values-based performance to reinforce the desired culture. Are people doing the right thing? And so many times what we do is we, we go around picking the weeds in our garden, but we never water the good stuff. We don't reinforce the positive things that people are doing. And so what's the value, whether I do good or bad, it doesn't matter. I'm not even getting recognized at all. So the people that are, are leading well and contributing well, demonstrating respect, we need to reinforce those behaviors. Nine, establish mechanisms for advice and safe reporting to encourage bystanders and targets to blow the whistle. Do we have safe and secure processes? Do people feel comfortable voicing things? Are they going to be treated with respect? Or are they going to be blown off? dismissed. One organization I was uh, working with did some research, found out there was a high concentration of uh, toxic behaviors in this one organization. Uh, collected some data, went to the senior leader, the senior executive, said, here's what's going on. Well, Ken, did you only talk to the troublemakers? There was this denial, not wanting to accept the fact that there were, these people were, uh, a couple of the supervisors were, were bad. So conduct departure interviews. What's going on? Why are you leaving? Tell me about it. And then collect enough data to terminate people. The focus is on creating an ethical culture. So are the expectations cl clear? How congruent is the espoused culture and the actual culture? Do people have the resources to do their job? Is it be, are the resources being shared equitably? Do people pe feel safe and secure and supported emotionally? Is there a, lots of spin going on or is there spent transparent communication? Do people feel that they can voice their issues and concerns? Are people held accountable? That's the kind of culture that we want. So. Consider the garden. What kind of garden do we want? I have just a few more minutes. And so it may be that you say, Ken, that's really cool. There's a lot of cost involved. Um, yeah, I know about the toxic people. Uh, I know about the per perpetrators. Yeah, we got to take care of the culture. We got to have a, a, an ethical culture. But I'm dealing with this right now. I'm just keeping my head above water. I'm just... I, I'm just just before dropping everything and walking out the door. How do I deal with this? So let's just spend a few more minutes thinking about uh, if, if we're a, a target, how do we handle this? So I refer back to um, the article about swimming with the sharks. Research shows that most of the targets demonstrate some kind of um, vulnerability, let's say. And uh, a lot of the research shows that these are the kinds of people who tend to be the targets of workplace bullies, of abusive supervisors, of toxic personalities. There's some kind of power imbalance. And the article about swimming with the sharks, the sponge divers, says rule number two is don't bleed. <laughs> okay, now that sounds a little weird. But apparently, we can train our bodies that when we're cut, not to bleed. And apparently, we can do this emotionally that we, if we have this tendency to demonstrate a negative affect, a tendency towards sadness, if we make ourselves vulnerable, there's a way to appear that we are not vulnerable. My um, friend, I have a friend that was in a situation and I shared this article with them and 
they, they developed that as a mantra to never let the shark see you bleed. And whenever they were going through a tough time, it was never let the shark see you bleed. So that's the metaphor. There's sharks out there. And we can swim with the sharks. So how do we do it? How do we not bleed? Don't take it personally, but accept the reality. A lot of times what we do is we, we engage in denial or judgment or blame. We deny it. I, I can't believe this is happening. We spend a lot of time in disbelief. I can't believe I'm in this situation. And then we engage in judgment. It shouldn't be this way. You know, I should be in this kind of environment. The environment should be respectful and trusting. And then blame. Well, if it wasn't that person's uh, for doing this, it's all that person's fault. And we uh, start blaming. And we spend a lot of energy denying, judging, blaming. What are we doing? We're bleeding. We're showing the, the shark that we are vulnerable. Here, come attack me. Now, I'm not, this is not blaming the victim. I want to be clear. I'm not blaming the victim, but there are some things that we can do to shore up our appearance. Practice good health, physical fitness, and nutrition. Take care of yourself. The tendency is we're in, the, we're in these hostile environments to let things go. Reframe the situation. You know, it's not my problem. That's their problem. They're, they're a shark. They're doing what sharks do. I have to protect myself. What does this mean for me? How can I learn? How can I grow? How can I change? Come up with a metaphor to help you deal with it. I, I need to put on my toxic protective suit. I need to not bleed. I'm swimming with the sharks. Come up with something to help you deal with it. I mentioned my friend um, Jude Black. She said the, the best thing that the family members did was and, and, uh, in dealing with their toxic, uh, their, their spouse's toxic boss was they created some emotional distance. They created an emotional safe zone that they grew, grew together. They developed increased trust among themselves to take care of themselves. So... If you've been in the military, you know if you're in a toxic environment, the first thing is limit exposure. And if you're swimming with the sharks and you can't stop <coughs> bleeding, it's time to get out of the water. Okay? Or if somebody else is bleeding, maybe it's not you, you know, don't relish in that. Help them get out of the water. Uh, don't retaliate or perpetuate negative gossip. You're, you're perpetuating the bleeding. You know, the, the water cooler talk, do something positive. Yeah, you need to share that uh, to, for mutual support, but don't dwell on it. Create the safe zone. And find somebody to help you deal with the stress. So let's talk about direct encounters. And rule number four from swimming with the sharks Counter any aggression immediately in a non-threatening manner. You want to show the shark that you're not just going to be their meal, right? So you don't want to antagonize the shark, so don't interrupt them. But ask some questions. Did you really mean what you say? Could you say that again? I didn't catch that. Or give some feedback and observations. Hey, you really seem frustrated. You seem angry. You seem upset. What's up with that? And then maybe follow up by parroting what they said. You said this, is that right? Did, did I really get it? And then a last part, which is very powerful, is empathy. What does a narcissistic person want more than anything else? Sorry? To be loved. To be loved. They want attention. They want recognition. They want just like everybody else. So when we follow something like this, did you? Is that what you really meant to say? Or you seem frustrated? Or this situation must be really stressful for you. When we show empathy, we're saying, 
I know you're in shock. Don't come at me. I know it must be tough being in shock. And that is a way of preempting them. So try that. Confront and challenge with caution. And you don't want to facilitate defense. And you don't want to make the shark angry. So preparing for self-defense. These are some things that are probably um, intuitive. But document everything. Use some objective criteria. My boss is so mean. You know, when people find out this is my, you know, my passion, I, I hear all kinds of stories. And some of them are like, well, the boss is just a tough boss. And they're just holding people accountable. Gee, so you got a tough boss. Others are very specific. So if you're documenting stuff, you can't just go to the IG or EO and say, oh, I have a really mean boss. I mean, provide some very specific details. Identify who are the protectors, who are the buffers, who can you trust, who can you not trust, who might have authority to act, who can you share it with, and Except that if you report it, you're probably going to have a hard time. I mean, think about some of the recent whistleblowing activities that we've seen uh, very public. But remind yourself that the investment is worth it. Why? Because you are helping create the kind of culture that will enable people to thrive and flourish. Yeah. Okay. So here's the recipe for a toxic culture. Don't clarify the values. Have systems that reinforce toxic behavior. Don't hold people accountable. Keep on holding the pressure to, to do more with less in times of downsizing. But if you want to detox, really clarify the values. Teach people how to create a respectful and trusting culture. Evaluate, promote, select based upon the values and not just results, but also values create self-awareness and hold everyone accountable. So what kind of garden do you want? What kind of gardener are you going to be? If you're swimming with sharks, how are you going to handle it? Thank you very much for your attention. Let's have some questions. The best part. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you not get them there? And so, how do you, in calling for references, what questions can you ask, keeping in mind that if it's the federal supervisor, they're probably going to get rid of that person. And so, mm -hmm. they might be honest with you. Yeah. But then also, what could you ask that person in an interview to kind of weed them out? Yeah, really good question. So, I'd say the first thing is you need to have really clear in your mind what. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you said you asked me to do it. Um, so the question is, uh, if you're if you're hiring somebody, how, what kind of questions can you ask to identify someone that might be counterproductive? Um, so I would say that the first thing is have very clearly in your mind the kind of values that you want on, in a team member. Um, if you if you can't tolerate uh, because it would sabotage, um, what kind of values, if they were violated, would sabotage the mission and, and sabotage the plans? Um, respect, dignity, trust. So then your, your questions would certainly flow out of that. Please, um, how does this person uh, demonstrate respect toward, toward their fellow team members? Um, and I, I think putting it in a positive way you know, rather than say, asking, have you ever known this person to disrespect other people? <laughs> okay, well, nobody's going to answer that, it's particularly if they want to, as you mentioned, if they want to try to push that person out of their if, you know, organization and you know, pass them on to you. So why do I ask it a, a positive way? Have you seen some, you know, when has there been a time that they demonstrated respect in a, in a challenging situation? Or, um, uh, you know, so, uh, that was similar questions like that. Um, I'm, I'm drawing, that's a really good question, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now, but. I would have never thought to ask it like that and provide that context. Mm -hmm. but, but you could you could branch off of that. Yes, sir. An example of how cultivating teamwork and collaboration. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give me an example uh, of how that person has cultivated teamwork. Um, when has there been a, a challenging, uh, stressful time in the organization, and how did that person contribute to resolution? Yeah. Good. What else? Yes, ma'am. Um, I had some conversations with that leader. Um, the, the leader was, um, you know, I, I shared some of the uh, feedback to her about some of her behavior. Um, and the response had to do a lot with denial. Of, and we're, we're going through lots of changes and I have some people that are not uh, performing well. I need to, in, you know, I, I need to help you know get them going so uh, it was more you know it's it's not me it's you know, I, I'm I'm a GS 15 I've been around forever I, I mean I, I know how to lead people you know <laughs> so 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 it's it's them they they need to adjust you know so that that was how the conversation went yeah. which I mean that's pretty pretty typical if and a lot of the studies showed that um, the toxic personalities, particularly ones that are inherent, uh, they, they're not aware, totally, you know, they have no awareness. And I mean, it's, that's backed up by our research of our students that said, the, you know, at least twice a week, or at least once a week, 90% showed uh, no self-awareness whatsoever. Yeah. So you really have to uh, be very persistent and very clear about their behavior and how it's affecting their team. Yeah. Good. We actually have a question from one of our members of the online audience. Uh, so what effects, if any, has the increased use of technology in the workplace had on workplace toxicity? And if there is an effect, is it possible to harness it for good? Uh, to harness technology for good? Okay, yeah. Um, so that's, wow, that's a really good question. I really haven't uh, done a lot of research in that area about the effect of um, increase in technology on, you know, is there a relationship? Just haven't done that. There's so much research that needs to be done. So my, I'm, I'm just going to give an opinion I, I do think there are some studies that I've seen that uh, the increase in technology has diminished the ability to interact and develop relationships and has an adverse effect on emotional intelligence. So I, I would s tend to say that there's probably a connection, there's probably a relationship um, between those two. Um, leadership, uh, I very strongly believe that leadership is not just the actions of the leader to cause some kind of effect. Leadership is a relationship. And so if we're relying more on technology uh, rather than personal interaction, then that's probably going to exacerbate, you know, toxic personalities. Um, uh, on the other hand, we can certainly use technology to develop relationships, can't we? If it's done in the right way, you know. Um, I try to be very careful personally about my email correspondence. Am I, am I making sure that nobody can misconstrue what I'm, I'm saying? You know, I remember um, one, one of the toxic leaders, or so I did it again, toxic bosses that I had was uh, a senior chaplain. And uh, this, this chaplain, I, I was not in his direct chain of command uh, I respond. I, I would belong to another organization, but he liked to t uh, ta uh, task me to do stuff, mm -hmm. and um, and if I could, I would. But there were times where I couldn't, and there was this ongoing uh, email exchange between he and some other people, and I was CC'd, and and 
I was being tasked to do something that I couldn't do. Um, and so I wrote back to everybody, uh, excuse me, but I have this, this, and this, so I can't do that. And so, of course, it was taken like, excuse me, <laughs> not, not like, well, please excuse me for butting in. I'm just kind of <laughs> CC'd, so I'm just going to. So I try to be very careful about my email correspondence that I'm making sure that nobody can misinterpret what I'm trying to say. So um, I guess I'm rambling a little bit, but um, I think there's a way to use technology to facilitate trust if we're very careful about it. So, yeah. Other? Yes, sir. Uh, on your slide about perpetrators, um, you had listed a list of types of toxicity. Mm -hmm. um, and the situational makes a lot of sense about a command and control kind of a military background. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. So I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, I'm just seeing that, you know, maybe there's, you know, like to borrow the, the metaphor, maybe there's some fish out there and they're, they're kind of benign, they're just fish, but they may act like a shark. So I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there's a distinction between situational and functional. So um, you know, one of the things I'm doing is, is I'm trying to get leaders who have been accused of hostile work environment to chat with me so I can figure this out. Um, but it seems to me that there may be a group of people that feel like in order to be able to get things done, they have to be abusive, they have to be harsh, they have to be uncaring, they have to uh, shame people. Um, the inherent kind, it just comes naturally for them. That's how they learn to get things from their parents and how they learn to get things uh, as adults, but I think there may be a group that are functionally that feel like in this particular organization, this is what I got to do uh, as a leader. They, maybe they have a, a perception of that. So um, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So if you've got any any ideas, I'm, I'm all ears. As a follow up, which leads nicely leads to my question I had, which was about intent whether certain leaders intentionally are toxic or engage in behaviors that are mm -hmm. toxic? Or is it kind of like, that's just the way I am, people like we just go through life so, you know, without intent? And could that be a difference? I mean, functionality, I feel like it's a little bit more intentional. So like, I'm not a toxic person, but I'm gonna behave in a negative mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Situational is kind of like, it's context, yeah. right? In one yeah, context, right. the behaviors are totally appropriate, but in other contexts, they're not. So could that be a sort yeah, of way to elaborate I, absolutely, on that? Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. I think intent could be uh, part of that, in that uh, the functional, hey, I'm gonna, I, I am choosing to be this way. My, my intent is I need to get results, so this is what it takes. So they're choosing it. Um, the situational leader that I'm thinking of uh, actually, there are several situational leaders that I'm, I'm familiar with and thinking of. They would say, I'm not toxic, I'm just passionate. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that, that's a, a quote. Uh, I'm passionate about the mission. Um, and they're not realizing that their passion is often taken as, well, hostility, you know, if you're not used to that. Um, they might play well in Afghanistan or Iraq, but not so much somewhere else. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great distinction. I hadn't thought of it that way. But, mm -hmm. um, and the inherently toxic person, as far as their intent, they they think they they have the best of intentions. You know, um, yeah, this is just this is just who I am. Right? Yeah, good, sir. Sure. Making them self-aware and actually becoming less toxic or 
<laughs> yes, I. Here's okay. Here's so here's the problem. Um, I wish I could say I've had lots of success, um, individually and organizationally. Uh, I have not had lots of success, um, and for a number of reasons. One is most talks, most people that are counterproductive, they don't see. They're they're very blind, uh, and they're resistant to change. Um, and uh, yeah, why fix? And and here's the thing: they've been promoted up through the system, um, and so this is this has been the source of my success. So I see no reason to change now. So you've got GS15 or a senior executive or um, a flag officer uh, that okay, you know. So there's there's some they've been reinforced over their time of their career. Uh, so I haven't had very much success, um, and there've been a couple of people that you know they've entered into um, coaching relationships with me, and I've tried to help help them, and they've had they've had some moderate success in, in I wouldn't call it great success. Um, most of the organizations that I've tried to address have um, not b believed you know that. Well, we have a toxic situation. Because yeah. um, now, let me let me back up. Organizations I've worked with, a lot of the remember the the birds on the the wire. Mm -hmm. The people down here, they know that they're a toxic situation, but they're in no position to affect any change. Mm -hmm. So I go up here and talk to this person. They're Probably. yeah, <laughs> you know, whatever. Or. Here's what often happens, particularly in government and military. They may see some dysfunction, and their solution to the dysfunction is, well, let's restructure. Yeah. Or, yeah, let's do a survey. Um, I mean, I know an organization that, that there was uh, the results of the climate survey demonstrated lots of toxicity, but they didn't want to address it, and they fabricated some other problem as a distraction because they had to come up with something to say, and it was totally not accurate. So anyway, uh, answer your question. Yes, well, I was just going to comment that uh, you know, we've talked about this in terms of like individual actors, <coughs> but having mm -hmm. also worked in that five-sided building, uh, there's lots mm -hmm. of cultures that can reinforce it over time. And you know, you start off in boot camp, and you have a certain leadership style with the you know, drill instructors. And then the higher up you go in the, in the Pentagon, mm -hmm. it seems like that comes back. Um, and just a quick note, I remember starting off in the DOD um, <clears throat> and preparing for a briefing for senior leaders. And one of the things that, we, one of the exercises we did, it was called a murder board, where you would present it to a group of peers and they would rip it apart because they knew when you went into a, a brief the senior executives, you're gonna get torn apart. So they were preparing you for that. And the nice word they use is murder board. Um, but I think, <clears throat> I think, when you look at the federal in, uh, employee viewpoint survey scores, you look at the range of, of different places. I think when you when you work at different places, you are going to see different cultures, and the, and the tone starts from the top um, in the intelligence community. One of the highest FMCS, thank goodness, in the ADR world is at the top. Mm -hmm. um, there are some others, and, and and I think there are some notable differences that they are not tolerating. They're they're incorporating the values and they're doing some of the things that you're doing. But how do you how do you shift how do you shift those um, organizations that, like you said, are reinforced not just individual actors across almost you know the majority of leaders are reinforced um, mm -hmm. at the ages are reinforced. So yeah. it's something that we can all tackle together. But yeah, yeah. Um, it's the challenge is getting people to realize that there's an issue. Okay, Are, is is it acceptable that we're wasting ten to fifteen, maybe twenty percent of our employees' time, energy, resources, attention, um, mental capacity? I mean, how do you get? I, that's that's where I'm at now. I have the struggle of. I know there's an issue because as a chaplain, I've had lots of people come to me. I've done lots of research on how it occurs and the cost. When is somebody going to pay attention to this? Not not just me, but there's there's dozens of other people that are are trying to get the attention of people and say we need to do something about 
our, our leadership practices and our organizational culture and the, and the systems. I mean, the, uh, going back to the promotion, in the military, our promotion system is based on the evaluation system. The evaluation system is all based upon uh, performance-based measures. So as long as I can demonstrate, either actually or percep perceptionally, that I am a high achiever, I'm going to get pr promoted. You know, I'm going to get an evaluation. I'm going to get promoted. I'm going to get selected to, you know, the key positions. And if I've been a jerk to people, it doesn't really matter. You know, so our system reinforces that. You know, that's one example. Uh, there was another hand. Or else. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have another question from someone in our online audience. So what do you do when you know you have a shark? in a working group that encompasses program offices across the agency. I tried having a facilitator, but that person was also overrun. Mm. Mm. Yeah, good, yeah, that's a really good question. USA jobs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> USA jobs. Um, yeah, he, he says, yeah. Um, is, I mean, so, who are the who are the protectors? Who are the buffers? Who are are the is there anybody that has any influence over the shark um, that can address it? Um, those are the questions that I ask. I mean, it may be one organization that uh, I was uh, working with. I mean, it went up the shark. Well. The protectors were the highest people in the highest ranking people in the organization. So there was nowhere to go. I mean, what do you do? Well, so I think a, a person has to decide, you know, like, you know, Captain Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean, there's only two things in this world, what a man can't do and what a man can't do. So, or a woman, as the case may be. Um, so is, do you have to stay in that job? I mean, going back to the article, um, and I hate, we, we have this thing that we don't want to be quitters, but if we're bleeding, maybe it's time to get out of the water, okay? So, um, so those are kind of the things that I'm thinking is, is there anybody that has any influence? What kind of toxic person is this? Is it, is it an inherently toxic person? They're probably not going to change. You're not going to get them to change. They're a shark. That's the way it is. They feed on people. Okay. Um, if they're functionally toxic or situations, can you get them to change their methods? Maybe. If if someone is willing to coach them consistently um, and show them that their behavior is not working right. So those are the kinds of things that I try to think through and help people think through in that respect. I hope that hel is helpful in answering the question. Um, so, yeah, I would, sir. I would, I would like to reinforce the idea of having a coach of some sort, some neutral mm -hmm. person that can have those difficult conversations. They're independent. They're out. They're not in their chain mm -hmm. and they're, the, the person is confidential. So mm -hmm. you can have that, uh, you can have that conversation and quote unquote, call them out on certain things, you know, with the three, so maybe perhaps combined with the 360 stuff. So it has some blind spots and, mm -hmm. um, and, and hope and help encourage more productive, see the impact on the mission or, you know, in a way and, and translate it in a way that they understand, um, mm -hmm. but that can go a long way. Mm -hmm. Coaches and shameless plug for ombuds <laughs> yeah. can't be, uh, they can be effective. We've seen yeah. it, seen it uh, work mm -hmm. really well. Yeah. So just to, for people who are listening in, uh, the comment was about uh, uh, finding someone to help coach you. And um, you know, I, I coach people, I'm a big fan of coaching. There's a lot of great coaches out there. There's some that are not so great. So, some, in some circles, coaching has a bad reputation, but if you can find someone that can help you uh, not bleed, if someone can help you help shore up your um, ability to fend off the sharks, help you manage your stress. Uh, I think it's very, very powerful. I mean, even the you know professional golfers, they have swing coaches. Professional athletes, they have coaches. I mean, they just don't go out on the field. So 
Why can't we just say, hey, I need somebody to help coach me through this. Teach me some skills that I need. So, so I, I totally affirm that. Great suggestion. What else? Sorry, I was just gonna say one more thing <laughs> real quick. Uh, maybe you might have seen this, that the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs uh, a long time ago did this cartoon um, mock mediation for three little pigs. I don't know, did you have all seen that? Google three pigs mediation Veterans Affairs. And it's, <clears throat> it's, it's funny because it's interesting because first of all, it's a really good model of the mediation process, but it also um, takes the big bad wolf as having a, you know, coming from a different perspective. They're not just necessarily, the big bad wolf wasn't necessarily a shark per se, had a whole different perspective. So, you know, us being in the ADR world and, you know, eternal optimists, there's always a possibility <laughs> that the shark may have not intended to be that way. Um, so just, just think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Um, obviously, the, the, the discussion has been focused on leadership and, you know, their approach to leadership. Um, how does that apply to employees? I mean, we've had colleagues that may have exhibited the same types of behaviors as a potential toxic leader may. Mm -hmm. Are there the same dynamics at work, or is there some other advice that or commentary you may have as far as dealing with colleagues? Who yeah, are like a, a peer, peer is. Peer, exactly. Yeah, cool. yeah. Well, the, the, the power differential uh, is different. Right, yeah. Right. Um, so, the your uh, my ability to influence my peer uh, is dependent on how credible I am to to my peer. How have I developed a relationship of trust? Um, particularly someone who is toxic, either either of the three kinds. Um, so. Am I credible? Do, are they look? Do they see me as someone who is um, looking out for their best best interests? Um, am I going to keep my word, practice what I preach? Um, have do I demonstrate in my own life um, that I'm self aware, that I know how to get results in ways that inspire trust? So if I have that kind of credible relationship with my peer, then I can go uh, and confront in a respectful manner and say, hey, do you realize what your behavior is doing to the rest of the team? Do you realize, yeah, you're very skilled, you contribute this. On the other hand, you're creating a tax on the team. There's, there's a deficit because of your behavior and your impact. So the dynamic is different, but I, I think part of one of the reasons why our cultures aren't as strong as they are is because we don't have people taking the step or having the courage to go confront their peers. Um, they, they see something and, oh, that's just the way Mary is or that's just the way John is and we just tolerate and accept it instead of saying, hey, our organization of value is respect. And when you talk, I, was, I overheard you talking to, to Joey um, that's, that's not really helpful. You know, what's going on? You know, why would you lash out like that? Tell me about this. You know, having a, a good conversation uh, with them. So, yeah. Well, it's actually 1.30 unless on the dot. <laughs> right. So we appreciate you coming and speaking with us and speaking to our online attendees and also for, for answering all the questions that we have. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it.